Okay, guys, I think this is like part four. Getting a little sore here. I might have to give up for a little while. We're going through Michael Bowen's book. I never knew you. I would give permission to freely give this out through PDF, and I have. Um, so it's called I Never Knew You. It's how he was in the church, and he was changing his life and giving up sin and all this stuff, and he never had assurance of salvation. And thank God he didn't because he was never born again. He's trusting partly in what he did, and he finally got the real gospel and was born of God. So uh, <clears throat> we're reading, uh, we're, we're, we're comparing the true biblical salvation, which is faith in the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, which gives you eternal life because he has fixed what the first Adam did as the last Adam. So it's why your works can't do, you, your works can't restore what Adam lost. Uh, so watch my last Adam video so you can understand why it's all Jesus. Okay, so this book is called I Never Knew You, and we're going to be going over John Hagee, and this grieves me very much, because many of these preachers I really like, they're very charismatic, they're very charming, they seem very caring, however, they have another gospel, which is not another, we're not saying that they're evil, or they're not saved, it's just the, the gospel is accursed, and uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, it's the spirits behind these people, sometimes I don't even think they realize what they're doing by mixing discipleship and your works in with the salvific message because it corrupts it. God's not going to accept another payment, another contract. He's only going to accept the blood to purchase you, uh, not anything you're doing. So it's very dangerous. Okay. So let's continue. Now, if you want to understand this, go to my first in this video series. It's very long. It's 41 minutes. I apologize for that. The last end of it is showing Joel Osteen. He's a charming man, very good self-help dude, but uh, has another plan of salvation. And the first part is the intro of this man's book. So we're in chapter uh, six of his book and video four in my series. I have skipped Charles Stanley because I've heard him give the gospel and it's true. Uh, I've never heard him corrupt the gospel. So I'm hesitant to do that because I know he's a true man of God. So I'm kind of studying on that before I make that decision. Okay, bear with me on that. Uh, it's not because I like him, it's because I've heard him defend the true gospel of grace before. All right, so, plan of salvation according to John Hagee. John Hagee is the pastor of the Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. His mission in the ministry is to, quote, aggressively fulfill the Great Commission by making disciples out of all people, to bring the lost to Christ, and to support fellow believers. By the way, you become a believer, and then you can choose to be a disciple, but you got to be saved first, okay? Because you following Christ and being a disciple is work, and you can't bring that into salvation. You'll hear many say, count the cost, pick up your cross. It's Jesus' cross that saved you. Okay, you pick up yours because you love him and he did save you. All right, John Hagee's television show can be seen all over the world. His show is almost every day on the TBN station as well as other stations. He's written many books, yada, yada, yada. He's a good, sincere man who preaches his sermons with both a force and a conviction rarely seen in other pastors today. In fact, one of his trademarks is to shout loudly phrases such as give him praise and glory. So give us a hand clap of praise for the Lord. I hear him say it all the time. Praise God. All right. He's very uh, thoroughly entertaining, very intelligent, and a master of the art of public speaking. Again, it doesn't matter how sincere someone is to sit with faint words and fair speeches. They'll deceive the simple. All right. John, uh, Hagee's ministry operates a well-built internet site. You may visit his John Hagee Ministries website and read about him as ministry and about everything his ministry, ministry accomplishes. To learn of John Hagee's plan of salvation, you'll have to watch the salvation video that is posted on his ministry's internet page. Simply go to his site, click upon the link entitled Salvation. You'll be taken to his video presentation when you arrive. Uh, click to play. I will paraphrase for you the plan of salvation according to John Hagee rather than write it for you word for word so as to avoid any legal copyright issues. I, I assure you this is very accurate. He's just trying not to, you know, be in copyright infringement. The plan of salvation according to John Hagee is as follows, paraphrased. <clears throat> By the way, there's so much truth in all of these and you got to be very well acquainted with the truth so you can spot the counterfeits and the subtlety that the guy leaves. 
John Hagee says we're all sinners. Very true. He quotes Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Hagee says that we all need Christ's blood to cleanse us from our sins. Amen to that. Hagee says that our good works cannot save us. Amen again. He says that God loves us, and he quotes Romans 5.8, which says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Hagee says that Jesus is God's gift to us. Very true. Then he quotes Romans 6.23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So far, it's so good. Hagee says repeatedly that salvation is a gift from God, and we cannot earn the gift by works. But wait, he's going to turn around and put some works in there, I guarantee it. Hagee then quotes Ephesians 2.8.9, which says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is why so many people defend these false teachers. Because they say, see, it's by grace, blah, 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 and then they'll put something in that works, and they won't realize it's works. It's just crazy. He keeps saying it's by grace, and it's faith, and it has nothing to do with us. But he talks about repentance as a turning from sin. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. So you, you stop trusting in yourselves. Repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. Repentance towards life. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It's trusting in Christ. It's change your mind and trusting only in what Jesus did and not what you do. Peter told the Jews to repent. Why? Because they had just crucified the Lord of glory. So now they had to repent of that and believe on him. So uh, it has nothing to do with sin. Sin is transgression of the law. To repent of sin is to repent of breaking God's law or to keep God's law. Nobody's ever repented of all their sins, ever. That is something a saved person does for the rest of their lives to the best of their ability to serve God. Once the Holy Spirit's in them, not to get saved. It's crazy. He says that turning from your sins are required action on all. I want, I, look, I'm not trying to be ugly here, but the same people. He will say you have to turn from sin, but gluttony is considered as bad as drunkenness. And this man is almost 500 pounds. I'm just showing the hypocrisy. I'm not trying to be mean here. Because I'm overweight. I gained weight after I had my kid and was in a wheelchair. I never lost it. So I'm not here to like condemn somebody for being overweight. I'm just trying to show the hypocrisy of it. Nobody's ever turned from all their sins. And if that's the qualification, then we're all lost. He says it's required, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hagee says in light of this verse that we have to confess Jesus as Lord with our mouth. So he, he says you have to speak it aloud. That No, no, no people aren't getting this. this is, that's a whole other conversation. But again, we also verbally have to confess our sins. So he's naming more works of righteousness, more religious works. And then he says, he teaches we have to ask Christ to come into our hearts. Again, you can do that a million times, come into my heart, come into my heart. It won't work. You have to trust in what Christ did for you, and then he does live in your heart. And whom we trusted, we were still with the Holy Spirit of promise, you see? So he does live in you as the temple of God once you've trusted in Christ. Then he said you have to say a prayer of salvation, a sinner's prayer. You won't see that anywhere. I've said that in the other videos. Not the Philippian jailer, not Philip and the eunuch. You won't see it. It doesn't happen. To ask him in your heart to forgive us. You don't have to ask him for anything because he freely offers it by his grace as a finished work. You don't have to ask for what he already did. And then he says he has to be the Lord of your life. Now here is where you add the big works. Okay, because now it's about you obeying him as the Lord of your life, which is what? To keep the commandments or to keep the law. So we're adding works of righteousness, but it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, saved us by the washing of regeneration or renewing of the Holy Ghost. It has nothing to do with you living a certain way. Okay, how you live after you're saved determines reward, suffering, loss of it is in 1 Corinthians 3, bl uh, blessing, uh, chastisement consequences of sin in your life here on earth but it has nothing to do with you being restored for eternity through the shed blood of Christ you were bought with a price okay we're supposed to put on the new man we're saved unto good works okay but not by them and then if you if it's about you making him lord of your life it's a subtle way of adding works that never gives you assurance and nor should it because now it's about how you live and how you perform and how well you obey but obeying the gospel is to remain steadfast in what Christ did for you and not what you do for God. Hagee says we must tell God that we will obey him. So we're going to lie to God. 
He knows we're not going to obey him perfectly. We'll just tell God a lie and we're saved. We obey him and follow him all the days of our lives. What about the days we don't? What about the minutes we don't? What about the time you flip somebody off because you get mad? You didn't follow Christ just then. Are you really saved? Do you see what happens when you start looking to yourself and not Jesus? Okay. And plus the strength of sin is the law. You're going to find you struggle with sin so much more because you're condemned and you're under the law than under God's grace. Okay. Because grace. Oh, man. People just don't get grace. Oh. They, they just add so much. They add, they put so much truth. It's not of yourselves. It's free. It's a free gift, but you gotta do this. It's not of yourselves, but it's of yourselves. It's not of works, but these are the works you gotta do. It's just double talk. My goodness. It says, for a pastor to be guilty of malpractice is much more serious than a doctor. When a pastor or a Bible teacher promotes a false plan of salvation, the results are eternal and not merely temporal. At this point, I would like to share with you the plan of salvation according to Jesus Christ. Since Christ wrote the Bible using the inks and scrolls of people, I would like to share various verses with you on what Christ says about salvation, not what he says. Not what he says. He's wrong, wrong, wrong people. He's going to quote Christ directly, and in some he does, and some he does. So some are the words of Christ, and some are of the apostles, which are still the words of Christ, because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to believe on him alone in chapter 3 of John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, and to us all, in John 3, 16, that, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did Jesus lie? Come on. The only requirement Jesus mentioned in the verse is believeth, which in the original Greek manuscript means to trust. Trust. I trust my Savior did the work to give me eternal life. Please watch my last Adam video to understand why your works cannot restore what Adam lost. The last Adam, Jesus, had to do that. Your works can't do it. All right? I want you to understand why it has to be Christ alone. <laughs> and he told him that Jesus was the Messiah and he'd die for the sins of the world and he would rise from the dead. By implica implication, Christ always meant that he would die, be buried, and rise from the dead when he spoke of believing in him. Nicodemus asked Christ how he might go back into his mother's womb and Jesus had to correct him by telling him that being born again involved being reborn spiritually. Because he asked, how do I get back into my mother's womb? Come on. That's people thinking carnally. Christ did not tell Nicodemus or you and me that he had to stop sinning or that he had to follow him for the rest of his life in obedient discipleship in order to be born again. These are decisions we make once we are saved. Are we going to follow him? Because it's a blessed life to follow him. It really is. And it's our reasonable service to do that. It says we put our bodies under subjection because it's a reasonable service. That's what Paul said he did. All right? But not to be saved. Christ said simply believe in him and again by default he always meant that one he was the Messiah two he died for our sins three he'd come back to life in three days Nicodemus believed Christ Nicodemus became born again the instant he believed believed in Christ however Nicodemus never became a disciple of Christ Judas on the other hand was a disciple of Christ yet Judas never trusted Christ as a savior how does it know how do we know because it said he knew who believed and who would who did not believe and who would betray him? Nic Nicodemus is in heaven as we speak, but Judas is in hell awaiting his sentence at the future great white throne judgment, where he'll be sentenced by Christ himself to the lake of fire. In Thess Thess Thessalonians 4, ooh, that's a tongue twister, 414, we see Christ's plan of salvation with complete clarity. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Pay close attention to that first phrase. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, is the plan of salvation according to Christ. The second phrase deals with the dead in Christ whose bodies will rise out of the grave of the rapture. With this chapter of Thessalonians deals primarily with the future event of the rapture, we're given the plan of salvation according to Christ in its most superlative simplicity. This is exactly what Jesus was telling Nicodemus and us in John, in John chapter 3. According to Ephesians 2.8.9, God is telling us through Paul, that by, by, by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
This means that salvation is a free gift given to God by all who place their trust in his son alone, apart from works. And by works, God is in fact returned to anything of self. God is saying that anything of self cannot be added to what Christ did, which is the gospel of our salvation. It's what he did that gives us eternal life, okay? Including turning from sins and following him in obedience for the rest of our lives. Those are aspects of discipleship and things that should accompany salvation after we're saved. This is crazy. Any plan that mixes grace with discipleship, which is works, is a false plan of salvation. Rather, they come after salvation if you choose to be his disciple. While Hagee quotes Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in his salvation video and vehemently agrees with this verse, he then contradicts himself this very same passage of scripture because of his academic mistakes. He misdefines the word repentance. Instead of using the original Greek translation for repent, he uses the English definition, which is different from the intention God conveys in his Bible. God repents a bunch of times. It just means change your mind. That's it. Metanoia, meta, change. Noia, meaning mind. Join them together, change your mind. Very simple. All right. In Jonah 3.10, it says, God saw their works, that they turned from their wicked way, and then God repented of the evil he would do under them. God doesn't have any sin. All right. He tells us that Hagee says salvation's a free gift and can't be earned, but then turns right back around and makes quitting bad habits as well as obedience to Christ's lordship an essential part of salvation. How do you make that work? You don't. That's why people are confused. Hello? To give you an accurate equivalent of what Hagee is saying is here. Imagine you were to ask him for directions to how to get to San Francisco. You want to go to San Francisco with all your heart. You ask John Hagee for the directions that'll take you there. But instead, he gives you directions on how to get to Tampa, Florida. If you take him at his word, you will not arrive in San Francisco. Instead, you will end up in Tampa. If you take him at his word, but then look at the directions and then question him about your final destination, he will say emphatically that he has, in fact, given you accurate directions to San Francisco. If you press him on the subject, he'll read various portions of the road atlas to you. But even though you may have doubts about arriving in San Francisco, you assume he knows what he's talking about and you trust him. Anyway, however, days later you find yourself in Tampa rather than in San Francisco. Despite all the signs you saw along the way that never pointed to San Francisco, you saw the Tampa signs and you knew you were going in the wrong direction, but you so wanted to believe he told you the truth. So you didn't follow that small soft voice that said this is wrong this is wrong and i'm telling you not in a small soft voice it's wrong okay and don't believe me check scripture you choose to trust him rather than you knew what to be it's right you chose to trust what a man that claims to be of god says and who knows he might be of god he's telling it's a false he's a false gospel preacher i i, I don't know how this happens i can't say i i can't judge the man all right Friends, when you are on the road of a false plan of salvation, you will see God's signs all over the place if you're able only to understand a handful of the verses I've shared with you in this chapter. If you're on a road that leads you in the opposite direction of where you know you want to go, pay attention to the signs. In term of salvation, God says it's not of works. Hagee hey, also uses the same scripture as I do and claims salvation is not of works. But reader, turning from sins, obeying Christ as the Lord of your life is works it takes effort it's of yourselves and since ephesians 2 8 9 says salvation's not of yourselves how then can john hagee turn right back around and imply salvation is of yourselves and simultaneously saying over and over again that it's not of yourselves my goodness what confusion is god the author of confusion no satan is something is wrong something's very very wrong either hagee is right and christ is wrong or hagee's wrong and christ is right isn't it sad how so many intelligent and learned men and women cannot rightly define repentance? What they say about repentance flies in the face of the very scriptures they point out to us. If you say that salvation is a free gift and we can't earn it, then turn around and apply it'll cost you. You got to change your behavior, submit yourself to following Christ in obedience to his lordship in order to be saved and make it to heaven. And that's nothing more than double talk. It is literally the same thing as asking for directions to San Francisco 
but getting directions to Tampa. Trusting in turning from sins and making Christ the Lord of your life in addition to faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. <sighs> Sounds completely wonderful and holy. But it's not the plan of salvation according to Jesus Christ. It is a counterfeit of the original. Yes, Hagee is a good man. I admire Hagee in a lot of ways, especially his support of Israel. And I'm with him on that. But Hagee presents us with a plan of salvation that differs from the one Christ himself presents in the Bible. Friend, if you choose any plan of salvation other than the one Christ offers, you will stand before him at the great white throne judgment. You will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And you may even tell him all the wonderful works you did in his name. You may turn from your sins and follow him, but you never trusted in him alone. And you adding that, to what he did is a counterfeit plan. And God is not going to accept that contract. He's only going to accept the one his son gave in his blood. So you better be trusting only in that. You hear me? All right. You're going to be standing in the great white throne judgment. And this is what you'll hear. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Which, by the way, is all who see the Son believe on him. And he'll raise him up at the last day. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's preaching. And uh, in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Not I knew you and I lost you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. If you want to rely on your works, there are works of iniquity. And you, you aren't saved. You've got to have God's righteousness imputed because you trusted only in what his son did. You understand? Not what you do. It, it breaks my heart to have to do this, but it's true. Reader, if you remember one thing from this chapter, I want you to remember what the will of God the Father is concerning how, concerning how to be saved. Jesus said, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up to the last day. That's John 6, 40. So that's the will of the Father that he's talking about, believing on him. They never believed. Did they say, Lord, Lord, we trust you in your shed blood? We trust that you died on Calvary and suffered for us. And you said if we put our trust in what you did for us when you rose again on the third day, that we would have everlasting life and we'd rise again one day too. No, not, none of them said that. So look what we did for you. Jesus is saying, if we recognize him as the Messiah, that if we trust in him alone, his death, burial, and resurrection for everlasting life, we will be saved. Nowhere does the Bible say we must repent of sin. The phrase repent of sin does not occur. Not one time in the King James Bible, by the way. Not one time. Now, to Israel, it says, if my people will turn or repent from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. But that has nothing to do with uh, salvation. All right? They were under law, too, by the way. That was for the blessing and cursing of Israel and also so that we could see our sin so that the offense might abound so that we would have a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. If you place your trust in any plan of salvation other than the one Christ gives to us in the Bible, you will not go to heaven. Jesus said you wouldn't. You'll be cast into the lake of fire. And in Revelation 20, he talks about the great white throne again. And those people will be judged according to their works okay we don't want that we want to be judged on the work of christ and have god's righteousness all right guys god bless